Now, I do want to make one thing clear. Uh, Jim was very concerned that, uh, that maybe what would happen is we would have services tonight, and then he and his family wouldn't be here, and we would all think it was because of the Super Bowl. But in reality, it would be because he lives south of 101st on Yale and that it would be too snowy. But now the elders have relieved him of that concern. So now we know that Jim is staying home tonight because of the Super Bowl, not because the elders canceled the service. <laughs> so <laughs> it's good to get that clear. The truth comes out. <laughs> oh, my. <clears throat> I, uh, I really kind of hate to wrap this up this morning, and in reality, I, I won't. So uh, I, I think we're going to go back next week and, and uh, grab some of the, the really strong themes and favorite passages and songs. I think that we'll probably go back and sing. By the way, the song we just sang is out of our text this morning. And so many of our songs come from uh, 1 John, and, and uh, they're not always obvious because a songwriter will take one theme like that and then build two or three other verses and so pretty soon you've you you know you may be other places in the bible by the time you get through singing the song you forget that actually the song was inspired uh from the verses that we'll read today so uh this has been our theme come on in and it's been god's invitation to us to come inside his nice warm abode and uh to enjoy his presence there we go so we did come on in and then we did shut the door which was Leave the world outside. Be his child. His invitation to us uh, to be his children. And the reason for that is because of the warmth of his love. And today I want us to meet our brother. Now for some people, you know, they come into the house. They leave the world outside. Take their shoes off. They realize that God wants them to be his child. And the idea of there being a warm love that now gives them a new family. And now they have a new brother. This is all news you know, to the person that just comes to Christ. Uh, don't really understand that, that you know, God is after a, a warm you know, family experience in his invitation. And so we're meeting our brother. And today... Uh, by the way, in John, 1 John 5, there are several passages that a lot of people struggle with and stumble over. And uh, we'll, we're going to read the whole chapter today, so we'll get to those. But when you see them in their context, they're not nearly as troublesome as reading them by themselves. So here's how it begins. This commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Chapter 4, verse 21. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Now this, the ideas in these verses have been already presented in the book of John, but not in this way, not, not with this slant. That is the idea that, that we should love one another, that we should love our brother, that we should love God, that we should keep His commandments. All these things have been mentioned before in the book. But what he does is he puts, he puts the ball together in a different order. He said, here's, here's the whole situation. Yes, we need to be loving our brother. But here's, here's how that plays out. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, what you're doing is you're loving the other child born to your father. Meet your brother. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as God's son you're really not getting in on the family experience that God has in mind here. And we know that there were teachers in John's day that, that wanted to kind of hurry up over the idea that Jesus was God's son in the flesh. And they wanted to adjust that or change it or make it different. And John says, no, that's very, that's very crucial to the whole idea of what God wants. So don't, don't skip that part. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And again, saying, you know, this faith that we have, this, this belief that Jesus is God's Son, gives us a victory that makes the door able to be shut, that makes it possible for us to take off our dirty shoes, that makes our overcoming of the things that, that try to call back 
uh, call us back into the world, uh, we're, we're bigger than those things because greater is he who is in us than he who's in the world. And, and so, again, John is bringing a lot of what he's already said together, and our victory is our faith. Now, John is not giving up on the idea that, that Jesus did all the work of salvation. That's, uh, that's not the idea here. There, this, you know, John hasn't left grace in the dust. He's not saying, well, you know, it's all on us, and, you know, it's your faith is the most important thing. No, he's simply looking at our faith and saying, this is a very key point. And you don't want to get to a place where you think, you don't have to believe. You don't have to worry about what God wants you to do. You know, Jesus does everything. God did it all. You don't have anything to do. And a lot of religious people say those words today. And really, you know, that's, there's some truth in that, but that's not the whole truth. And so John comes back uh, to that in these verses. Here's kind of the way that looks, looking at our, our previous um, Outside there's darkness, falsehood, hate, lawlessness, where there are children of the devil. Inside there's light, truth, love, righteousness, where are children of God. And we talked last week about the false prophets that are against Christ. The Antichrist was mentioned. But then, then John says, you put this whole package together, and here are your choices. You can have the devil, you can have God. You can be the, a child of the devil, and that's the sort of things you're going to deal with in your life. Or you can be inside, and, and the way the household runs inside, you, you don't have all those things. You don't have those worries. And these false prophets that are coming along trying to tell you, you know, you don't have a brother. He wasn't, he wasn't real. He, he wasn't physically here. You know, that was a spiritual reality. And John says, no, he's your brother, and this is real. And, and we saw him, and we touched him, and we were with him, and we know good and well he was here physically in the flesh. And that's what John is trying to get across. So in this house, we are loved, and we love in return. We love our father's child, and we obey or try to please our father. Those commandments are not a problem. They're not a burden, he says. You know, when you're in a healthy situation where you're loved and you give love back, doing what someone wants you to do is not a burden. And, and John says that's the way these commandments ought to feel to us. We shouldn't feel like, well, God's always making us do something. God's always telling me what I can't do. Yeah, look at the whole picture here. You want to be out in the cold or you want to be in around the fire? You, know, you want to be in where there's light or you want to be out there where there's darkness? You want to know who tells you what you have to do? That's the devil. The devil's the one trying to get you to do things that don't help you and aren't good for you. And we overcome because we trust the Father and... His offspring, Jesus. Now, this is one of those problem passages. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is truth. Now, I want to take you to the Old Testament real quick and show you a verse that talks about testimony. Because in a trial testimony is officially given and it's to be disregarded under certain circumstances. So are we going to are we going to honor the testifying that we see in this verse or not? Deuteronomy 19:15 says, "A single witness shall not rise up against a man on account of any iniquity or any sin which he has committed. On the evidence of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be confirmed." Now we need to know for a fact that this happened. We don't take one person's word against another in court. We, we like to have two or three witnesses, and certainly in, in uh, uh, the old law, that, that was the, the way it went. And so how many witnesses are there that testify about Jesus? Well, there are three. There are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. The testimony of God is this. That he has testified concerning his son. So the testimony is God's testimony. It's God's claim. I am sending my son into the world. Do you believe it? I am sending my son into the world. Do you accept him as your brother? Are you going to try to make your own way or are you going to accept what I'm offering to you? And this is God's testimony strengthened with witnesses, three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now, 
Interestingly enough, this is one of the few passages in Scripture where you see all three of those in the same passage. Let me show you a couple that mention two of them. For instance, in Matthew 3, after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were open. He saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, you see the, you see the similarity there? You have, a, you have a father who's proud, who is testifying about his son. His son has been baptized in water, and he sends his spirit down in the form of a dove to confirm this is real. This happened. I am in on this event. That's two of the three. Then in John chapter 3, Nicodemus came, and Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, that seems to show some similarity to what we just read. I mean, Nicodemus is coming, and Jesus has just been baptized, and, and the Spirit testifies about who he is. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you know, you really need to be born of the water. You need to be born of the Spirit. There's two of the three. And then John, the witness at Jesus' crucifixion, noted this. One of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified. His testimony is true. He knows that he's telling the truth so that you also may believe. And I really believe this passage in 1 John comes from these verses because it's the same writer. And he's using this word testify. And he's, and he's for whatever reason, indelibly imp impressioned in his mind is the scene on the cross where there's water and blood at the cross. And then Jesus gave up his spirit. So we, we see all these things come about, and, and I think at this point we have to take the eyewitness's testimony. You know, we don't have to completely understand how he arrived at what he's saying, although I think these are some good evidences. But we do need to take what he's saying. I'm saying that God testifies, he uses the spirit, the water, and the blood to say, this is my son, and I'm pleased. So you need to believe that. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he's not believed in the testimony God has given concerning his Son. The testimony is this, in case you missed it. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life, the eternal life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. He's so concrete about his explanations here. You want to have God? You want to have the eternal life that's offered? Then you have to accept God's only begotten Son. That beloved verse from John 3. This is a testimony that he says we have inside ourselves. And I believe that is the spirit that he has given to us that he's talked about often in this book. Well, everyone who comes in must believe the father who invited them testified about his child and not believing in that father and in that son makes the father a liar john makes this intensely personal you know, a lot of people today say well you know i love i love god but i don't love jesus or i got i love jesus but i don't love the church or i love this but i don't you know john says time out you're going to come in the house, you're going to put your feet up in front of the fire and warm off your wet toes. You're going to have to take the package. The package is this. This is my house. That was my son. He is your brother. I, all this love comes from him and because of him. And it's all for you to have. But you've got to take the package. You can't say, well, I like this, but I don't like that. Uh, it's, you don't pick and choose. If you're going to be in the house, you take what someone offers you. And so... John says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have the eternal life that's promised. And this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Well, I like being in the house and everything. But, you know, even in here sometimes I think, you know, is this real? I mean, I haven't been outside in a long time, and, you know, maybe it's better outside. I haven't been out there into all that temptation and mess and trouble and darkness. And, 
deception and all the things that go on. I wonder if I'm in the right place. I wonder if I've done enough to be God's child and in the right place. John says, you know, everything I'm writing, I, the, the reason for writing this is so you'll know. So that you'll know you have eternal life. And your confidence is further bolstered in the idea that you do have this two-way relationship. You ask the Father things, He grants requests. The Father asks you things, by the way, and you obey Him. You grant His requests. It's a two-way street, and that's how it works. In this two-way relationship, we believe Him. We know that we have eternal life. We have confidence in not only our lives here and in our prayers, but in the judgment as we talked last week. We know that He hears what we ask, and we have confidence that He grants these requests that are made in His will. Now, we don't, we don't get to ask God, well, God, you know, I really want to be in your house, and I want to have, you know, comfort and light and warmth and everything, but I want what's out in the darkness too. So I'm praying that, and you love me, so you're going to give me what I want. God said, no. That doesn't make any sense. You know, you, you want to be in the house, let's talk about things that have to do with the house. Let's talk about what life eternal. Don't, don't say, I want life eternal, but I, but I want what Satan has to offer too. That doesn't make any sense. That's not going to work, and I'm not going to grant that because it's not in your best interest. So in this two-way relationship, there's confidence, there's assurance, and there is eternal life, life now and life later. Now, here's the second one of those difficult passages. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will give, uh, God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say he should make a request for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Well, in the context of all that John has said, this passage is not nearly as uh, mysterious as it might appear reading it by itself. What John has talked about through the entire book is, Jesus came to take away sin. We walk in the light, and we confess our sin, and He is faithful and He is righteous to forgive that sin. It goes away. We don't have to worry about sin if we're walking in the light. We don't have to worry about sin if we're confessing, being honest with God about our sin. Now, if we lie to ourselves or we try to lie to God, you know, that's not a good thing. So what do you suppose is a sin that leads to death? Well, it would make sense that it's a sin that doesn't fit the, the situation in the house the way God has designed it. It's trying to have both ways. It's, it's trying to reject God's Son, Jesus. It's doing something that, that you're not going to be able to be forgiven for it because you're not willing to stay in the house. He can't forgive us if we say, I want to be in here, but I've got to go out here for a while. <laughs> you know, he can't say, well, okay, so enjoy the fire while you're outside where the fire isn't. That makes no sense. It makes no sense for us to try to live with a foot in both worlds. And to the extent that we are living and walking in the light and enjoying the eternal life and we commit a sin... That doesn't lead to death. Why? Because we're going to be open about that sin. We're going to confess that sin. He is faithful and righteous to forgive that sin. We don't have to worry about that kind of sin. The kind of sin we need to worry about is a sin that we don't want to be honest about before God or a sin that we choose instead of God. And that would be a problem. We know that no one born of God sins. He who was born of God keeps him. The evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come, has given us understanding, so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So, John, as he comes toward the end of this book, one verse left, he says, here's, here's what it all is. You know, Jesus is God's Son. He is the one who was born of God in the only begotten sense, John 3, 16. No one born of God sins, but the one who was born of God, Jesus, keeps one who occasionally sins, one who sins not leading to death. 
And the evil one can't get to him. Why? Because we're overcomers. We've overcome because we have this relationship with our brother. And our brother makes sure that we are not taken away by our sins. And so we have understanding. And we know we're with the truth because we know we're, we have God. He's living in us. We're, we're comfortable and confident. And this is true. So what are my options? Well, idols. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like... John tails this book off. This is where he ends it. He has the whole book with this phrase. Little children, guard yourself from idols. Don't accept substitutes. Don't go after something that can't give you eternal life. Don't go after something that simply promises eternal life but can't deliver. Don't go after something that takes you away from the house, away from the fire, away from the warmth of his love, away from his son who died for you. Don't accept substitutes. Come on in. Shut the door. Be his child. The warmth you experience is love. And I'm going to up the ante a little bit and not just say meet your brother. You're going to need to trust your brother. Your brother is the son of God. Your brother was here before you were in this house. Your brother not only knows the ropes... He's been everywhere you've been, and he's overcome it. He's seen every temptation you've ever experienced, and he was better than that. He obeyed God to the point of death and was honored by God by being raised from the dead. He lives today as our brother in our house, a victor, overcome by his faith because he obeyed. He did what God wanted. He did what was pleasing to God when he lived on the earth and since. He is our brother. We trust him. We believe in him. We say, I know you came from God, and we can be in the house. It's really not that difficult. It's not burdensome, as he would say, though some struggle with that issue. I want to invite you this morning, if you have not expressed your trust in Jesus as your brother, if you've not lived as if God wants you to overcome the world, but you've given in and, and, and maybe succumbed to temptation from time to time, in a way that has dragged you toward death, understand that you're being invited back inside, you're being invited to the fire, you're being invited to the warmth of His love, and there you can have confidence, you can have safety, and you can have a family that will not quit. We invite you, whatever your need might be, to come and express it while we stand and sing.